I was born in Toronto, and it's been home base all my life. I'm not quite sure why. Primarily, it's a matter of convenience, I suppose. I'm not really cut out for city living, and given my druthers, I'd avoid all cities and simply live in the country. Toronto, however, belongs on a very short list of cities which I've visited, and which seem to offer to me, at any rate, peace of mind. Cities which, for want of a better definition, do not impose their cityness upon you. Leningrad, in my experience at least, is probably the best example of the truly peaceful city. I think that if I could come to grips with the language and the political system, I could live a very productive life in Leningrad. On the other hand, I'd have a crack up for sure if I were compelled to live in New York or Rome, and of course, any Torontonian worthy of the name feels that way about Montreal on principle. Toronto's had a remarkably good press in recent years. It's been called the new great city, or a model of the alternate future, and not by Torontonians. These delightful epithets have come from American and European magazines and city planners. But Canadians, by and large, are less complimentary. Until very recently, Hogtown was the preferred description of Toronto by Canadians from other parts of the country. And it has been said that one of the few unifying factors in this very divided land is that all Canadians share it as like, however perverse or irrational it may be, for Toronto. We natives, by the way, actually call Toronto Toronto. And I'm bound to make the slip sooner or later, but the first British settlers called it York. Specifically, Fort York. Toronto's real founder, Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe, proclaimed in 1793 that the town would become a palladium of British loyalty. Of his plans for the settlement, Simcoe wrote, There is to be one church, one university to guard the Constitution. At every street corner a century, the very stones are to proclaim, God save the king. There's a saying in Canada's political life, which has become almost a cliche, that our society is a cultural mosaic. The political purpose of this saying is to enable us to distinguish ourselves from the Americans who are fond of describing their society as a melting pot. And the implication is that in Canada, and I should think nowhere better exemplified than in Toronto, however intense the heat, we do not melt. No better example of the old Toronto versus the new than our two city halls which stand on adjacent properties. Uh, this one is known, logically enough, as Old City Hall, and it was built in 1899 by a Canadian by the name of E.J. Lennox. He actually spent about 12 years on the project, and before that, by way of research, he took a busman's holiday to Pennsylvania, where he apparently was inspired by the then new and still standing jail in Pittsburgh. I I happened to take a walk past Pittsburgh Jail once. I was in that city as part of a concert tour, which is the musical equivalent of a penitentiary sentence. And I must say that it looks not unlike old City Hall. Lennox maintained a remarkably consistent view of the appropriate enclosure for sinners and civil servants. New City Hall was built in 1965 by the Finnish architect Vio Revel. He died very prematurely just after the building was completed, and it was said at the time that his death may well have been hastened by the howls of outrage which some of our elected officials greeted his remarkably imaginative design. Toronto at that time was not exactly an hospitable spot for contemporary art of any sort, and the decision to situate this sculpture by Henry Moore in front of New City Hall was the straw that broke the political camel's back. His opponent is on record to the effect that Torontonians do not want abstract art shoved down their throats. And with that kind of critical perception, he, of course, won the election handily.
The Canadian National Exhibition is an amazing anachronism. It's the world's largest annual exposition, but its spirit is that of the small town fall fair. Time seems to have stood still at the X, as it's called, but it's not, properly speaking, an exercise in nostalgia. You can't experience a pang for the past without first accepting the inevitability of change. And indeed, when it celebrated its 100th birthday in 1978, more than three million people took in a bill of fare that was reassuringly similar to the sort of thing that was available when I was a kid, and which, barring a few frills, would have been right to home in any rural North American community at the turn of the century. kid, we tended to divide our parents into two camps, those who permitted visits to the X and those who did not. My parents fell into the latter category. I don't believe they felt that the Miss Dairy Princess contest was likely to corrupt the morals of the young, but they did feel that every contagious disease known to man lurked menacingly, if invisibly, in the late summer air. I was 18 when I was here last, and on that occasion I came to give a piano recital. The final item on my program was the seventh sonata by Prokofiev, which is to piano literature what Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture is to orchestral repertoire. Cannon fire isn't obligatory, but suitably updated artillery is certainly implied in the score. And even under normal circumstances, since it looks a lot harder to play than it really is, it's a surefire crowd pleaser. But the circumstances of my recital were not quite normal. It was supposed to end, as I recall, at six o'clock, but it didn't. I apparently indulged myself in the slow movement, and it ended instead at 6.02. Now, the X, old-fashioned as it may be, runs like clockwork. A dive-bombing demonstration was scheduled for 6.01. And the last moments of that performance would have warmed the cockles of P.T. Barnum's heart. This body of water is, of course, Lake Ontario, the most easterly and also the smallest of the Great Lakes, and perhaps one should say the least great of the Great Lakes, but it's still a sizable pond nonetheless. As a matter of fact, a Dutch friend of mine never tires of telling his relatives back home that you could drop all of Holland into this lake and still have room for enough windmills to keep Don Quixote busy for a lifetime. And actually, he's quite wrong. In fact, it's an outrageous exaggeration. I looked it up, and Holland is about 5,000 square miles larger than Lake Ontario. So you could drop it into Lake Superior or Lake Michigan or Lake Huron, and it would disappear without a trace. But if you tried it here, there would be very serious flooding.